Thank you, Leslie, for that introduction. And thank you all for showing up here to this talk. I know um, DDoS is the phantom that haunts some of your sleep. So uh, <laughs> thank you for showing up despite some of the trauma I'm sure some of you have experienced. Um, I'm in that boat too. Uh, I've been a DDoS or a, a DevOps engineer, <laughs> not a DDoS engineer, <laughs> for the last year or so. And before that, I worked in a shared web hosting environment. And if you're familiar, um, a lot of times these low-level DDoS attacks, um, if you're in a shared web hosting environment, will affect all of the other customers that happen to be on that same server. And so as the site performance and reliability expert in the building, I was often called in to help uh, put out the fires. So that's where a lot of my experience with DDoS attacks comes from. I learned a lot about DDoS attacks along the way. And so today we're going to talk about things like what is a DDoS attack? That's an important thing to start with. We'll look at botnets and malware and how the sphere of IoT and how it's continually evolving is playing into that. We'll take a brief look at the OSI model and some mitigation techniques, and then we'll finish it off with some prevention and legislation and just what's happening in the legal sphere around DDoS as well. Um, and hopefully we'll have time, but just in case we don't, um, you can catch me in the hall later. I'm hoping we'll have some time for Q&A at the end as well. So first of all, what is a DDoS attack? Uh, DDoS stands for Distributed Denial of Service, and the emphasis here is on distributed. So it's not a single vector of attack, it's not a single IP address, or even just a single network coming to attack you or your service. It's distributed from potentially a lot of other um, a lot of uh, places around the world. Cloudflare defines a DDoS attack as a malicious attempt to disrupt normal traffic of a targeted server, service, or network by overwhelming the target or its surrounding infrastructure with a flood of internet traffic. I think this is a really good way to put it because it calls out that it might not be a website, it might not be an, an application, it could be any one of these different things, and it could be not necessarily targeting your actual origin server, it could be targeting the network surrounding it or the DNS system surrounding it as well that prevents your real users from actually getting to use your service. So a DDoS attack can look something like this. It's not just a single point of origin coming to attack your website. It can be potentially distributed from all over the world. This is a tool called IP Viking from Norse Corp. And you can watch this real, this real type of traffic around the world at any point if you go and use this tool, which is really great. Um, but it can be really intimidating to look at something like that coming to a single target um, server. So some modern DDoS examples today. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the attack on GitHub's memcache servers in 2018. This is one that interrupted a lot of our work. Um, this one was kind of the start of a style of attacks that was, that was targeting memcache servers in particular. These attackers, they spoofed GitHub's IP address and found that they could query the memcache database caching layer and send a relatively small request with a really big payload in return and then flooded it with about 1.3 terabytes per second in bandwidth, which is pretty terrifying. But GitHub luckily already had a DDoS mitigation provider, and so all they really had to do was tap them, who stepped in, and within about 10 minutes, service was restored. So that was, that was pretty cool to see, that within about 10 minutes, 1.3 terabytes per second was mitigated. In 2017, there was a round of DDoS attacks going because of a malware that was spreading through Android-based applications, and this application basically allowed these apps and these devices to send traffic in the background um, with HTTP post and GET requests to targeted websites. A lot of DDoS mitigation services, um, they got together and they noticed user agent patterns that were in common through all of these, and they were able to work together through information sharing to block it basically across the board. So that was really cool to see as well. If you were working in the web hosting sphere in 2016, the Mirai botnet was probably the bane of your existence. <laughs> this was a botnet that was made by a group of teens that uh, they were using, uh, they, they basically created a malware and, and didn't realize completely what they had done. <laughs> 
this malware was really pervasive, right? It, uh, it targeted IoT devices, scanned for open ports, brute forced regular username and password credentials, and this malware spread really quickly, so they were able to create a really big botnet. And then to avoid culpability, in case they were found out, they made it open source. <laughs> which was so great because then everyone could use it and make their own special flavors of the Mirai botnet. So we saw lots of these attacks around the world. Um, at its peak, it hit 1.1 terabytes per second in traffic as well. Um, probably the worst and most catastrophic one was the level three and dying DNS attacks in 2016 as well. Um, I, re I like to refer to this as the day the internet died. <laughs> because working in web hosting, it was really hard to explain to people that pay you $5 a month that, no, no, the server that actually hosts your site is completely fine. It's just that no one can access your site because all of the backbones of the internet on the entire East Coast are just down. <laughs> that was not a fun day. Um, and so yeah, this, this was an attack on DNS resolver servers, and they used an attack method called prepending, where they basically sent these uh, queries to DNS servers that looked legitimate. They had a real root domain like google.com, but they prepended a random string or some sort of jargon for the subdomain so that the DNS resolver server actually had to go to the back end and see, does this actually exist? Which is a pretty computationally heavy thing. And so that's how they managed to take down uh, a lot of the internet. It used to be back in the day, in the 90s, you could get together with a group of your friends, and if you all clicked on a website a bunch of times, all in a row, you could take it down. And that was kind of fun, right? <laughs> but, of course, as dependence on the internet grew, and as people got more and more dependent on the services that the internet provided, scalability, resiliency was really, really important. And so, websites began to be able to scale a lot better. But of course, as scalability got better, so did attacks. So attacks got more complex, they got bigger in terms of bandwidth, and they reached a peak in 2018 of 1.7 terabytes per second. And you might be looking at this graph and going, who has all that time on their hands? Who gives a crap about sending all of this targeted traffic to a website? Well, there could be a lot of different reasons for a DDoS attack. It may be that they want to ransom you or your service. Uh, they'll send DDoS traffic until you pay them a certain amount. It might be an employee or a customer that's pissed off and they have a vendetta against you. It may be hacktivism, where they just disagree with your website or your service's message. Um, or they might want your secure data. That's becoming one of the most valuable resources that a company may have is their customer's data. Um, and it may just be an attempt to disarm your business, too. A lot of times DDoS attacks are distraction <coughs> tactics so that while you're being DDoS, they're actually breaching your data and stealing that in the background as well. But the reality is that in, today, in today's world where there's a lot of DDoS for hire services out there, you don't really even have to have a solid motive. All you have to have is money and means to go and use one of these services and target whatever website you want. And that's kind of a bummer because DDoSs are not cheap. Um, a Kaspersky study in 2017 found that if you're a small and medium-sized business, on average, you're looking at about $120,000 if you're DDoSed. And it's even bigger for enterprises at about $2 million on average. And an Encapsula study showed that about 50% of DDoS attacks, they last between six and 24 hours. So that's six to 24 hours of your IT people, your DevOps people pulling their hair out and rapidly trying to rebuild all of your infrastructure. And they cost about $40,000 per hour during that time. That same study showed that one in three of these targeted sites acknowledged that customer data was breached in this as well. And about one in five acknowledged that intellectual property was lost. So part of that secret sauce that makes your, uh, your company, your business, what it is, some of that was lost in a DDoS attack as well. So it's not just about the money a lot of times. And last but not least, it's really important to consider that there's reputation damage at stake as well. If you have a mission-critical application that people depend on for productivity or worse, things like banking and security and emergency services, if you even have a few minutes of unscheduled downtime, that's enough to make customers start doubting that your service is trustworthy. 
So if you're thinking about six to 24 hours of disruption, that's a lot of cause for customers to leave your business and a lot of cause for new customers to, to second guess signing up with you in the first place. So it can disrupt your sales process for sure. And my shameless plug for DevOps is that your DevOps people are gonna be losing a lot of sleep during this process as well. So you have a lot of diminished productivity plus the cost of rebuilding infrastructure and the bandwidth that you're uh, being charged for as well. So you may be wondering, well, who has all the time on their hands to go buy all of that space in data centers to distribute their attack all over the world? Um, that's not what's happening. <laughs> Attackers don't go buy services to distribute their attacks around the world. No, they simply hijack them. And so they create services uh, services. They create things like botnets with their particular brand of malware to create that, this network that they're able to use to spread these attacks. So botnet is just a conjunction of the words robot and network. Very clever, I know. And it has three main components. First of all, you've got your bot herder, a very malicious looking person, probably with flamethrowers. <laughs> And they wield a particular brand, a particular shade of malware. And their goal is to distribute this malware as far and wide as they possibly can on as many devices as they can and turn those devices effectively into their zombie army. And these zombies are essentially uh, able to take commands from the bot herder through this malware, through a chat relay system of some sort that allows them to then send this targeted traffic based on what the attacker wants. Um, IoT plays into malware and botnets like crazy. There's this perception out there that if your UI only allows you to do a couple things on your Internet of Things, your Internet-connected device, that it must be secure, right? <laughs> I can only click a couple buttons from it, so what could it possibly be hijacked there? Well, no, the, the sphere of the Internet of Things is growing every single day. There's Internet-connected fridges. My car has a Wi-Fi signal. Um, <laughs> there's Internet-connected toothbrushes. There's, you know, your normal things like your gaming servers, your computers, your smartwatches, and your phones, your baby monitor, your smart doorbell. They're everywhere, and they're growing like crazy. And the scary thing is that the sphere of the Internet of Things is growing way faster than regulation can actually keep up. So a lot of things have happened in the name of keeping things simple and easy for customers out there. So in enabling a really quick setup for customers, you have things like default security settings, a default username and password that a lot of users never think to change. So, Think about when was the last time, I mean, in this crowd probably a lot of you, but when was the last time you actually logged into the admin control panel of your router and thought, you know what, I should rotate that password? Not a lot, right? I showed my mom how to do that this weekend. <laughs> um, then there's things to consider like peer-to-peer -peer communications. There's, let's, let's say for example, a smart doorbell. These, these video streaming services, a lot of times people don't really want to pay for the cloud storage that comes with storing video for long periods of time. And so they think, I'll just bypass that. There's this universal plug and play setting. What that setting does on the back end is it opens a port on your router so that you can access it from your mobile device anywhere in the world. That's not the most secure thing. So instead, you want something in the middle. You want your cloud storage. That's not just something that's there that you have to pay for. It's there to help authenticate both ends of the communication between your mobile device and your smart doorbell. And then there's other things to consider, too, like the open ports is a big one. But think about things like Alexa or other listening devices that are out there. What did you sign up for when you signed that end user licensing agreement? Think of how they actually have to work. They have to process a large amount of data, that audio data. And what have you licensed them to do with that data? Your smart device might be thinking that you summoned it and might be sending an email to your coworker without you knowing. It might be sent back to Google or whoever to process for training their support techs or for training their AI ML. So think about what's happening in the background on a lot of these devices. And then last, 
think about the applications and things that you use on these devices. So there's a lot of applications out there that use a NoSQL data store. Um, MongoDB is a really common one that don't have a lot of default security settings enabled. And so if you just go with the defaults, you end up with an open data store that as long as an attacker can figure out how to brute force your credentials, magically you have a data breach. So think about things that you don't want on the internet, like your child's location on a tracking app. It's really important to consider the implications of having this data on the internet. So some common sanity checks that you can go through are just simple, simple things. Rotating your password every six months or a year, or just checking if there is a passcode, enabling it. Whenever you bring an IoT device into your home, you should be running through a couple of sanity checks in your head. But I have a couple of hard and fast rules that I always live by, which are pretty simple to remember. Rule number one, every internet connected device is a potential entry point for malware. I have to look at it through that lens. And then rule number two, if you can install malware on it, it can be used to attack you and others. So you, meaning that personal data that you don't necessarily want out there can be used against you from an attacker that wants a ransom or just used in ways that you don't necessarily condone. Or it can be used to attack others in the form of a DDoS attack. The reality is, like I said, there's this perception out there that if you just can do a couple of things on it from the end user side of it, that it's secure, but that's not really true. IoT is rife with malware. It's everywhere, <laughs> right? There's a couple different ways that this happens most often. So the first one is scanning for open ports. So simply scanning and looking to see what services and what ports are open, and then simply brute forcing them with common username and password combinations. So if you've never reset that default password on your device, that makes it really, really easy for an attacker to find and compromise. This is how the Mirai botnet works. This is how another botnet called Hajime that specifically targets uh, DVRs and CCTVs work. A lot of your botnets will use this method. They'll just gain a very long list of IP addresses through potentially sketchy means and then simply do a port scanning check against all of them. Once they find that open port, they just brute force the credentials. And then the other common way is your good old fashioned click fraud and spam. So things you click in your email or as you're browsing the internet that download malware in the background that you may or may not be aware of. Are you a bot? You can ask your IoT device this question all day. Hopefully they don't respond, that might be a little scary. <laughs> um, but users of the devices that have been compromised with malware are often completely unaware that it exists. And that's that's the tricky part about devices that are used in these DDoS attacks, is that most often users are completely unaware that their devices are being used in this way. Think about it. Unless your device has some sort of activity monitor or some sort of network monitor that you can actually watch and look through, there's a chance that you've probably never ever noticed or seen this. But some common things like just resetting your passwords on a regular basis, or if it has a passcode, setting it, that can help prevent malware or prevent an attacker from actually utilizing that malware um, if your device were to be compromised. But the other thing I would really recommend doing is using a service like Have I Been Pwned to see if your username or password have ever been compromised. And if so, and if you're like a lot of the people in the world where you use the same username and password for a lot of services, that means you need to go and reset those credentials because it's not just the service that's been breached, it's anywhere else that you use that combination. And pro tip, while you're going through that process, please reset it to something unique. So now that we've talked a little bit about DDoS attacks and where they tend to occur and how attackers can use your various IoT devices to make their botnets, let's look at the OSI model or as I like to call it, all of the layers of the internet cake, and uh, see where do attacks tend to happen in this model. So just briefly, we've got the physical layer. That's exactly what it says, just the stuff that's physically connecting together, like your ethernet cables, your bridges, your switches, and the like. And then you have your data link layer. This is the link between 
uh, devices that are on the same network. So if my iPhone and my router are on the same network, they're transferring data in frames on the data link layer. Layer three is your network layer, and this is where devices start communicating outside of their own network. So if I'm on my iPhone and I go to google.com, they're communicating at the network layer, at the most base la level. And so they're communicating using things like IP, ICMP ping, and they're transferring data in packets. And then layer four is the transport layer. This is the layer that's responsible for end-to-end -end communication and just making sure that flow control is smooth. So making sure that a fast network isn't overwhelming a slow network with too many packets per second, and then reporting back errors to the source or destination device, as it may be. So this is where TCP and UDP, SYN, that's all happening at this transport layer. Your session layer is where things like APIs and sockets communicate. So they're responsible for opening that session when you enter this network and then closing it when you leave. Layer six is all about encryption and decryption. So just making sure that your application or service is able to actually translate and, and understand the data that's being transferred to it. So it's where things like SSL, SSH, SFTP, those are all the S for secure because they're encrypted. And then finally, the icing on the internet cake, the application layer. This is the only layer in which human beings actually are interacting with your service or your website, as you may be. If I'm on Amazon.com adding th things to my website, I'm interacting at the application layer. I'm sending HTTP post and GET requests. I'm using DNS because that's the layer at which human beings are interacting with that service, with the internet. So when we're talking about DDoS attacks and the OSI model, those attacks happen on layers three, four, and seven most commonly. Layer three tends to be more low level. It's things like IP spoofing, packet sniffing, ping floods. And layer four is things like SYN floods and UDP floods. And then layer seven is where we start to see the more tricky ones to mitigate because these ones mimic the real users interacting with your site. They're using things like HTTP floods, um, they're using things like DNS poisoning and DNS amplification. And so these ones become more tricky because you have to sort the good from the bad at this layer. When it comes to mitigation, this can be kind of tricky, especially coming from the position I did because I was often the one called in when you're already being DDoSed. So I always like to tell people, just in case you were unclear on this, the best mitigation is to protect against DDoS before it happens. It's never a good situation to already be DDoSed and then think about mitigation. And here's why. So at a really basic level, you've got your app or your service or your website sitting on a server. You've got that content sitting on a server. And you're pointing your DNS, let's say, with an A record to that IP address of your server. If I'm a DNS attacker, or a DDoS attacker, that is, I'm going to go and look up where that website domain name is pointed, and I'm going to see that it points to the IP address of that origin server. And then I'm going to start sending traffic to that server. Dumpster fires ensue. <laughs> and you, as the owner of this website, might be thinking, I know. I'll put a DDoS mitigation service in place. And so you go and you change your DNS records and you point them to a service, let's say Akamai. And Akamai on the back end resolves your domain name to your actual origin server. But that doesn't help much because your attacker already knows the origin IP address of your actual server. And so they just continue sending traffic directly to that IP address. They don't have to worry about things like going through DNS anymore. They already know where your content actually lives. And so to actually make the DDoS attack stop, you've got to actually migrate to another server that has a different IP address or assign a different IP address to that server. And here's a pro tip for sysadmins out there. It turns out a lot of uh, server providers out there don't like DDoS attacks so much, and they might just cut off your service. If you ask them for a new IP address, they might turn you down because DDoS is against their terms of service. <laughs> That's happened. <laughs> so this can be a really, really tricky one to mitigate, and it really sucks to be in the middle of a DDoS attack and try furiously to actually access your content and migrate it to a new server when you can barely access your server in the first place. It's not fun. 
But if you start from the beginning with Akamai or some sort of DDoS mitigation service in place, when I go to look up those DNS records for the first time as an attacker, I'm going to see that you point to Akamai. And if I have any sort of wits about me, I'm probably going to be like, not worth it. <laughs> because I probably know that Akamai has over 2,000 points of presence around the world. And if I take down one Akamai server, that's nothing. Because when I start sending traffic, that's all I'm doing. <laughs> I'm setting the edge on fire just a teeny, teeny bit. And users that are actually trying to access my website, they can easily divert around it. So my service remains uninterrupted this whole time. And meanwhile, my customers are completely happy. My service is disrupted, maybe just a teeny, teeny, tiny bit. But the onus then becomes on your DDoS mitigation provider to actually take on that attack. Your DevOps people can sleep soundly in their beds at night. When it comes to DDoS protection services, there's three main schools of thought. And I will say before we get into any of them, make sure that they explicitly call out DDoS attacks. It's not good enough to just have a firewall, a WAF, because those things will protect against really good things, like your OWASP top 10 rule sets. That's really good. It'll allow you to block and deny different IP addresses, or if they're a little more advanced, maybe even user agents that are good and bad. They might block bad traffic on uh, UDP and TCP and ping floods at their edge network. That's great. But if they don't explicitly call out DDoS attacks, you might be in that same situation of the servers that aren't in their terms and conditions to support DDoS attacks, right? You might just get turned off if that were to happen. And that's not a good situation to be in. So please make sure that you use a service that calls out DDoS protection. So managed WAF services, again, they'll be your OWASP top 10. It'll allow you to block and deny things. You may even be able to block and deny countries. And if they explicitly call out DDoS attacks, they may have some sort of JavaScript cookie challenge for you as well that if you're under attack, it can help sort the wheat from the chaff. It can, because a lot of times botnets, they, don't, they either don't load JavaScript or they don't load JavaScript like human beings. And so it allows them to use a cookie-based authentication between you and the, the actual origin server. Caching and CDN services, content delivery networks are a great option because with this sort of a service, worst case scenario, they can soak the attack. They can just accept all of that extra bandwidth and still ride through it just fine. Um, so things like Cloudflare and Akamai, because they have so many points of presence around the world, DDoS becomes uh, small beans to them, small potatoes. Um, so these services oftentimes will support uh, protection from DDoS attacks, which is great. Um, and then there's the in-server protection. So if you have unusual traffic patterns that may otherwise be flagged by firewalls, or you just know your traffic really well and you know what's weighted good and weighted bad traffic, you might roll your own sort of solution and write some sort of combination between IP set or IP tables or failed ban uh, that's running on your actual server. This makes me a little uncomfortable a lot of times when it comes to DDoS because you're still inviting that DDoS traffic into your actual network and it could saturate that network pretty quickly. So even if you're deflecting it at the server level, it could still interrupt, it could still interrupt your actual end users. There is one service I know of called HiveShield that you can deploy on your servers while you're being DDoSed, provided you can actually access your server, that will do a similar sort of thing. But again, just be wary that you are, the closer you are to your actual network, your actual servers, the more chance you have of disrupting that service. So the further out to the edge of that content delivery network or firewall you can keep the attack, the better and more safe you'll be. So last, let's take a look at what's being done around the world to just prevent DDoS attacks as a whole. What sort of legislation are we passing? What sort of measures are we taking against those who are perpetrating these attacks? Well, there's a couple pieces of legislation to look at. The first is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which was passed in a very recent 1984. Um, this, this, uh, act, this act, which was passed in the US, doesn't explicitly call out DDoS because, well, it was 1984. Uh, but the action of DDoS does fall against into these illegal actions that are, that are illegal under this act. So if you are found guilty of this, you could be facing several years of prison time in the US. And in the UK, they have a little more recently passed in 2006 the Police and Justice Act, 
in which they do explicitly call out DDoS as something that's illegal. And if you're found guilty there, you could be facing up to 10 years in prison. And it may seem like there's not a whole lot of action happening because a lot of this, a lot of the action that has to happen around the world to bring some of these attackers to justice requires cross-country coordination between governments. And we all know that governments work very slowly. They're even more slow when it comes to working with each other a lot of times. But the, the attention towards DDoS attacks has definitely grown in awareness and in action in the last few years. So let's look at a, a brief timeline here. So in 2015, the hacktivist group Anonymous petitioned the DDoS to make DDoS legal because it's free speech, right? It's like a sit-in, <laughs> but online. No, the, the White House didn't go for that, so um, yeah, it's still definitely illegal to DDoS someone. Um, in 2016, there was a partnership between several European countries with Europol. They called it Operation Pleiades. They also have these really cool code names for these cross-country projects. Um, they were taking down the website DD4BC or, DD for, or DDoS for Bitcoin. Um, so they were able to help take down this DDoS for hire service. So that was pretty cool to see. In 2017, the FBI began explicitly ask, asking people who have been DDoSed to come forward and give them the details of the attack. And through things like that, they've been able to help take down attackers that have been sending multiple DDoS attacks across multiple different vectors. And that call for victims to come forward is still open. So if you have been DDoSed and you're curious, you can provide those details to the FBI. In 2018, I think one of the uh, biggest cross-country collaborations that we've seen happened between the US, the UK, and the Netherlands. They formed this uh, committee called Operation Powered Off. And they took down webstressor.org, which was one of the biggest DDoS for hire websites out there. But they didn't just take it down. They commandeered it. So they took the website content and the database when they took it down. And that meant that in 2019, Interpol was free to go after the users of webstressor.org and actually hold them accountable with jail time and things of that nature. So it's cool to see that we're actually seeing some action in this, in this regard. You remember the creators of the Mirai botnet who uh, made their malware open source? To, uh, to, to remove co culpability. They finally came to their court date last year, uh, but they've actually been doing a lot of work to help the FBI uh, research new, new uh, DDoS attack vectors. So when the attacks on Memcache were, in, were on the rise, basically, after the, the GitHub attack, they were able to help find common attack vectors and security settings that uh, that the FBI could use to then reach out to people who might be vulnerable and prevent these sites from being compromised. So they've actually helped the FBI on over 12 different cases of specific brands of malware and botnets and DDoS attacks and to help either mitigate them or bring people to justice. So they were able to basically, um, to basically use community service in this case to serve their sentence. And then, of course, in the absence of webstressor.org, what are people going to do without their DDoS for hire services? A bunch of booter sites came up in the absence of it as well, and the FBI has been hunting them down like whack-a-mole. So they shut down 15 different DDoS for hire websites earlier this year as well. So it is really good to see that even though sometimes it can feel like there's nothing happening, these these actions, even though they're slow to happen, they are happening. And the message is getting out there to people who are potentially looking to DDoS sites because our peak, our peak in volume in DDoS attacks hit in 2018. We haven't seen one higher than that yet, and that's great. I'm sure at some point we will, but it seems like the trend is that they're, they're going down overall, which is really good to see. All right. Now we have a section for Q&A. Does anyone have any questions for me? Leslie? And thank you, Jenna, first of all. Yeah. <laughs> all right, just a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please line up at the microphone, and please remember to keep your questions very short and brief. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Thanks. Um, I have a brief comment on one of the points you were, you were, you were making, and then uh, a question I'll take off answer, or take the answer offline. Very quick. Um, so, 
on between the uh, CDN and your origin, um, so some of the services provide some sort of IP shield uh, that you can put security uh, policies so you only accept from your CDN. So that's something uh, like Akamai has, for example. Correct, yes, um, and that's a really great way to, to go about it. If you do use a CDN service, um, if you're being DDoSed, I uh, highly recommend actually only allowing traffic to your origin server from that CDN service because then your attacker can't do this thing where they go around your firewall. A lot of low-end low users that I interacted with weren't savvy enough to get this point, and they actually had to use several CDN services, like proxying through each other, to actually obscure the, the origin IP after they had been migrated. So it can be pretty difficult. Interesting. So that, my uh, thought question would be, uh, it's actually kind of similar in architecture. So you know, if you have a single origin server, a single IP, you're kind of stuck there, as you were mentioning. Mm -hmm. And so you know, why not just kind of layer that a little bit? Um, your thoughts on you know, creating other origin servers in different regions that may just actually transport back and use Anycast or something like that? Yeah, Anycast is a really great solution for that. Thanks for bringing that up. Hi. <clears throat> Uh, so you mentioned a lot of things about, um, you know, laws that target the perpetrators of this with punitive measures. Is there anything that we can, are there any rumblings about laws that might be coming out um, that require uh, software makers, hardware makers to create safer products, like consumer protection laws that are going to sort of like say, well, no, you can't just release something that has scads of open ports, et cetera, et cetera? I hear you there, and I wish the answer was yes. Um, but I've actually asked several lawmakers, I come from Texas, and I asked several of my local um, lawmakers there to say, you know, it's, it's really embarrassing to watch Congress ask questions about this to some of the technology lawmakers. I'm not going to lie. Is there anything that, that we're doing to make IoT more secure, to, I, to make the default better, right? And they, um, they didn't seem optimistic. <laughs> Let's just say that. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks.